So we're going to go over a couple cases here, thanks to Alex, wherever, wherever he is sitting around for pulling the cases for us. <laughs> um, so what's, uh, what's your station tube function? Obviously, it's related to middle ear pressure regulation, protection of the middle ear space, which is sort of semi-sterile from the nasopharynx, and also clearage of things from the middle ear. We all see what we all see the eustachian tube normally when we're looking in uh, the torus here through the nose. When we talk about dysfunction, people have those vague complaints that are sometimes hard to really put a finger on. So it can be fullness or popping or crackling, ear pain, the feeling of fluid in their ears, even though they may not have any fluid in their ears. And then the, some of the things we might see on, uh, on testing or exam could be an abnormal tympanogram, uh, middle ear fusion, signs of atelectasis we saw in a bunch of these different examples, recurrent otitis media. Uh, cholesteatoma or symptoms of barotrauma, repeated uh, pain and so forth with flying. And then of course, we always see um, the things that uh, Brandon talked about earlier is with ongoing eustachian tube, we can do the most beautiful reconstruction. Everything looks great at a month after surgery. They come back six months later and all of your reconstruction is collapsed. So they can also be responsible for suboptimal hearing results and recurrent disease. So we think about eustachian tube dysfunction want to separate two different things in, in terms of your differential diagnosis, obstructive problems from patulous problems. And often the symptoms can overlay. We'll kind of come into that with some cases. And you always want to be thinking about referred otalgia. So uh, don't forget to have an extensive differential to rule out sort of the other things that can cause very similar symptoms um, to make sure you're not um, uh, confusing what is really a new station two problem from something else. So that will also come up. And uh, complete exam, we'll talk about this a little bit in terms of what people do for evaluating these complaints and when you might uh, use other levels of technology, whether it's imaging or uh, endoscopy and so forth. So um, in terms of treatment, there's a number of different things related to medical management and systemic uh, problems that individuals might have that might predispose them to use station two problems. Um, we can talk about that a little bit. And then there's uh, more recently uh, balloon dilation, which there are a number of different manufacturers that are showing some of the things that are available. The idea is very simple, inflating a balloon in the cartilaginous uh, portion of the eustachian tube to try to Im improve the way that that works uh, for ventilation of the middle ear. It was FDA approved uh, a number of years ago now and just a couple years ago, there are CPT codes that, will, that are used for that. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to always enable them to be billed and paid. So that's still an issue depending on where you are, I think. Um, so there, this is a helpful thing to look at. There's a consensus statement on balloon uh, eustachian tube dilation of the eustachian tube. And uh, it's important to remember that a consensus statement is not like a clinical practice guideline. So really, it's a bunch of experts. In this case, um, otologists, uh, rhinologists, allergy specialists um, who make statements about what expert opinion is or is in a clinical practice guideline, is there going to be in a more extensive, detailed, systematic review of the literature, levels of evidence, and so forth. So it's important to remember the differences between those kinds of statements in terms of uh, what, what statements are made and how you can use those to guide your practice based on evidence. So here's the first case. Um, so we have a, a younger uh, gentleman moved from Florida uh, to Virginia, complaints of fluctuating uh, muffled hearing, ear fullness, uh, and uh, today, I guess it's a woman, <laughs> feels that her ears are full. And she can't equalize the pressure um, in the middle ears. Pressure's feeling like it's affecting her work productivity, so very frustrating. Um, why don't we uh, uh, start with uh, Brian? You want to kind of go through some of the things you would think about? Yeah. Um, so she was doing OK before she moved, but um, maybe she developed some kind of an allergy problem when she was in Virginia. Um, Maybe that should be worked up, but we could, um, what else? Um, so do you do, do you always do an allergy workup or do you kind of treat these people medically first or what's kind of your, what's your, what's your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I don't have allergy in my office, so I can, so I just, um, I like to do, just treat empirically with nasal steroids and sometimes oral antihistamines uh, to see if it might help uh, some, of the, some of the symptoms she's having maybe have her proper ears a little bit better. Um, the vaping, I usually tell people that vaping's better than smoking, but I tell them that I don't tell them, don't, don't say I said anything. Um, I'm not sure if it may, it may affect it, maybe with the, the heat that's generated, possibly it may cause some swelling, it's hard to say. The cigar smoking is probably not good, so, but she doesn't do it very often, so hard to say. Any other thoughts on sort of what your 
how much medical management you do to, to feel you've been confidently uh, kind of excluded that you're going to treat this medically? Chad, looks like you have a thought. I was going to add on to that. Um, since she's feeling uh, quite a bit of symptoms, I would always get a hearing test uh, audiogram. Sorry. Thank you. So since she's feeling quite symptomatic, I would get a audiogram on her. If she has any uh, thresholds that are approaching zero or less than zero, I get a CT scan to look for superior canal dehiscence. Uh, sometimes patients uh, can have some uh, attic block. Um, but I pretty much pass that. If that's negative, I just go uh, treating them empirically and then uh, go from there. OK, I mean, I think the, the whether it's cigars or vaping, or whatever else, I think those are pretty important issues in, in determining what options you can offer a patient because I think you want to think about anything that's reversible because if, I mean, you have anatomic things potentially, but reversible things. So I think it's important to spend a lot of time counseling patients that any other intervention we do may be really worthless if they don't address the things that we know are going to cause uh, nasopharyngeal and inflammatory uh, changes. So, um, so this is the exam. Any comments, Gabby? Quick question. Yep. Uh, caffeine can uh, worsen um, eustachian tube dysfunction. Do you have any problems counseling people from Seattle to abstain from that? <laughs> uh, I, I, actually, I didn't know that. <laughs> so <laughs> I would never counsel way to stop coffee. <laughs> right. Maybe they had palpitations that were life threatening. <laughs> well, the drum looks reasonably normal. Um, uh, maybe a, a little overinflated posteriorly, but with the negative uh, Rene bilateral, I guess I'm more interested to see what's going on with the hearing. I don't think this would be a standard eustachian tube dysfunction. I'm not sure. We'll see what's on the next. Oh, okay. So, um, coming back to audiometry, what for eustachian tube evaluation? What what do you think the role is of? So we talked about the audiogram a little bit. So let's say she has uh, normal hearing, but what about tympanometry? Do you think that's useful? Is that I definitely use it because, again, sometimes you'll have the, it can sometimes help differentiate patchless from obstructive. And so you can have a drum that's atelectatic and then have a type 8 tympanogram because as soon as they put that in there, the drum is, you know, hyper compliant essentially, or it'll be a type AD tympanogram uh, if, it's, if it's patchless. So I do find that useful um, as an addition, in addition to the audiogram. Any other thoughts on tympanometry if that's helpful? What about if it's, uh, since, well, in terms of the timing, what about if it's a patient who, um, if we don't have time for the second case, what about if it's a patient who really only has these symptoms with airplane travel? What do you use that as a guide for what your management options are? Or? So that's kind of barrow challenged eustachian yeah. dysfunction. They're probably a patient that had ear infections in childhood, really don't have problems unless they're diving to the bottom of a pool or going up in an airplane. Um, and those are, you know, I think there's a number of options. I don't necessarily think that, you know, allergy management's probably going to help them in most cases. Um, I sometimes would have them try to use some Afrin or, you know, spray a day before and day of travel to see if that helps. If it's really bad and they're flying frequently, you could certainly, you know, put a pair of tubes, put some tubes in, or you can potentially offer them the balloon, but I, I have a hard time recommending that, say if they have a type A tympanogram and it's only occurring during you know, air travel, but it's, I, I think it's some people have, who do that, but I, I'm a little more conservative. Yeah, so I, I would say that, I don't know if anybody else has had this experience, but with some of these recurrent barrel trauma, usually it's been business people who, not as often now, but um, did a lot of frequent flying, and, uh, or pilots, for example, with a recurrent ear pain, even though they have a normal tympanogram. I have occasionally done balloon dilation in those um, people as an example, so. Does um, it help? Yeah. But I think it's, you know, we'll come back to it in terms of what the studies are with balloon dilation. Does anybody use the, so the eustachian tube uh, dysfunction questionnaire, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's a seven question, seven item uh, Likert, uh, seven uh, number Likert scale uh, test. Does anybody use that for kind of deciding what to do with patients and telling if they're responding to therapy or is it, um, is anybody using it? I think one of my partners does manages most of our patchless uh, adult patchless and yeah. you stage two patients, and so I think she uses it, but I've not I've not used it. Anybody else? Does anybody use it? 
I would, I strive to use it, but I forget. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the same thing. One important thing though with that, with the questionnaire, is it's pretty good at, I mean, it's very good at picking up eustachian tube symptoms. It's not really useful in distinguishing patulas from um, obstructive symptoms. So just because they score highly doesn't mean they have obstructive disease. So you always want to keep that in mind too. And if somebody's having these kind of symptoms like the one we were talking about, does anybody get any imaging to look, look at that or any other workup, medical workup, if her symptoms are so bothersome? I was going to say, if it was unilateral, then maybe consider imaging just to make sure there's not any nasopharyngeal process. And I, I you know, I, there has been a little bit of debate on whether, if you know, if someone has unilateral effusion or unilateral ET, eustachian tube dysfunction, what's better, an MP scope, a nasopharyngeal scope, or an MRI? Because you can have subcoastal disease that a nasopharyngoscope is not going to pick up. But it does seem a little like overkill to order an MRI for it. But it's not if you pick up the MP carcinoma. So, yeah. And for these symptoms, again, in this individual, would, would somebody, if, if say you've tried your, you know, in terms of the medical therapy, we mentioned um, nasal steroids. I think some people occasionally will try oral steroids. Some people will try combining nasal steroids and a nasal antihistamine, maybe slightly more effective. I guess the question is, would you try those things in somebody who has only eustachian tube symptoms with no nasal congestion? Um, I think you know the data showing that those uh, types of interventions are helpful for improving eustachian tube function is not very strong. So uh, we're kind of doing a, an empiric treatment, but it's not really well substantiated. Um, and who would, who would consider doing a myringotomy? Or would you go to straight to balloon dilation? Or what would you do if she's still frustrated? You tried the medications. I do a trial myringotomy first before I dilate. Uh, I usually tell patients that uh, in the first year, uh, two thirds of them will be happy with their decision, and then uh, a couple years out, only. Uh, I said I normally do a trial myringotomy uh, for patients just so they can see if they uh, like the result. Uh, and uh, yeah. Brian, any thoughts? Uh, same. I think I would offer her a myringotomy if she didn't want one. And we were convinced, well, you know, I'd probably do a myringotomy without a tube, just see how she feels over the next week or so. It usually closes up in a few days. And if she feels better, then you can argue to put a tube in or maybe try the balloon, I think. Is this with a normal tympanometry? Yeah. What's the question? It's, uh, what would you do if you, she basically has the same symptoms but has failed medical treatment? Still has that congested feeling, has a normal tympanogram. Would you do? Would you consider doing a myringotomy to see if it improved her symptoms, or even progressing to a balloon dilation? Yeah. So I always ask them what they're baking. It is amazing what people will bake, uh, and uh, and that may indeed have something to do with it as well. And the other thing, so vaping is one thing. You can also talk to them about uh, you know woodworkers, things that are maybe not using respirators, masks, and things like that. We're obviously wearing masks more often than we were, but. Other kinds of chemical exposures, some of those things can cause symptoms. I mean, it happens pretty often. You talk to people and say, well, yeah, actually I do, you know, I'm a, whatever, I'm a carpenter and I'm around all these things all the time or some kinds of fumes. So some of those things may not be avoidable, but things you can ask. I think it is helpful to do a myringotomy uh, in terms of a balloon dilation, because if I think that's, and we'll come back to that with a consensus statement, but if their symptoms really aren't improved with doing a myringotomy, if you release the pressure and they still have the same symptoms, then I think it's pretty suggestive that the pressure is not the problem. Um, and it may be some other symptom. I'd just add that I very aggressively asked them about heartburn and if there's any trace of heartburn, I have them take daily yep. Pepsi uh, trial. And then I also ask every possible question about TMJ dysfunction. And if they have any sense of anything positive, I send them to a physical therapist. Uh, one other plea for myringotomies, tube placements, office OR, there is no reason to put the tube anterior to the malleus. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> if you, unless it's a really atelectatic drum and there's a, no other place to put it, that's the hardest place to fix a perf. And so I know for a long time there was this myth of like you, you, you shouldn't put the tube over the round window because of phase cancellation and that, that's, a, that's false. There's a nice paper by Sam Merchant that shows that it doesn't matter where the perforation is, it's really size and then the volume of the middle mastoid. So posterior tubes. 
I usually find that patients who have normal uh, audio, normal tympanogram, and have these types of symptoms, uh, the balloon, it's really rare that they need a balloon. They're usually non-medical, like treating allergies, um, uh, making sure they don't have TMJ issues, like other GERD, too. So the balloon reimburses nicely, but I think it's rarely actually needed. Did she end up getting her allergies evaluated? I would, if she didn't do that, I would have her go back and do that before going back to a dilation. Make sure you've maximized any potential, you know, allergy management or vaping issues, or smoking cessation issues before considering any type of repeat dilation. I've never done a repeat dilation, but not to say it can't be done. Yeah, no, I haven't done a repeat one either. And then obviously, you do worry about this all happened after she moved. You worry about seasonal things, um, all those kinds of things that might explain this, that might in be independent of her eustachian tube dilation. Um, would anybody consider repeating it in terms of what's, what's your experience? Would, would people do a repeat dilation if they thought it worked initially? Anybody have any experience with that? I have a colleague who did it uh, twice on someone, but the second, I don't think either of them were successful, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, Doug, did you want to keep going or? Okay. So here's another case. Uh, so a 28 year old uh, uh, elevated BMI woman with uh, bilateral muffled hearing for the past four months still feels like she's underwater, has increased discomfort when driving downhill. She's had ear tubes when she was younger uh, for fluid, uh, no longer has uh, fluid. But um, no ear pain or drainage, basically otherwise uh, healthy with no medication. So um, any thoughts on this individual with, with those kind of symptoms? What, do, what, are you, what are you thinking, Chad? I would, so she's had uh, tubes before. I kind of question whether she has uh, adhesive uh, middle ear disease and maybe exacerbating her symptoms. I guess I'm being lazy. Um, since she's had tubes before, I would question whether she had uh, adhesive middle ear disease, uh, adhesions that could be uh, exacerbating her symptoms. Uh, so for me, I would want an audiogram, uh, definitely a um, micro microscopic ear exam. Um, Let's see what we have here. <laughs> Go, go back to the prior slide, please. Okay. Uh, then what was your question? So what's your, ne what's your next? So she has the same sort of symptoms. So um, I don't think we have anything on here, but here's your exam. So what are you, what are you seeing, Brian? Bilateral atelectasis on the right ears on the bottom. Um, there's retraction into the attic with um, some, I guess, some scutum erosion. You can see the head of the malleus um, up against the atelectatic drum. Um, I can't tell for sure there's fluid in the middle ear. There's probably some atelectasis, atelectasis of the pars tensa as well. There's some sclerosis. On the top, there's some also a severe retraction uh, in the attic. It seems like it's probably some possibly more retracted uh, in the pars tensa. Um, could be erosion of the incus. It's hard to tell from here. Um, no cholesteatoma that I can see. And it looks like she might have effusions there. So there's her audiogram. <clears throat> Is there a bone conduction line there? Um, oh, okay, yeah, I think so it's buried in the gray. Yeah, she has a moderately <laughs> large conductive loss bilaterally with type C tympanogram on the left, type B on the right, and intact word recognition scores. Any thoughts on what you would do to manage this patient in terms of? You know, I, I think it wouldn't be unreasonable. Well, yeah, I would try to have her Valsalva in clinic and see if she was able to ventilate. If not, I don't think it'd be unreasonable to try a myringotomy on her and see if she gets any relief in her symptoms and, and improve, improvement in her hearing. Um, and 
give that a few weeks, and if she does and the fluid reaccumulates, then you can do you know, tubes. One thing to keep in mind, though, most common presentation of CSF otorrhea is tympanostomy tubes. So she's an obese patient, um, and uh, sometimes you can have idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and that can also present with ear fullness, so something definitely to keep in mind. Yeah, especially if the chronicity of this is such that she had done well for a while and had, you know, um, hadn't had tubes in a long time and this is kind of an insidious onset uh, problem without a lot of other allergic symptoms and I think that's definitely the case. You would want to be thinking about that. Um, so would that change what you do? Would you still do a myringotomy? Uh, if I suspected they had a leak, if that flu fluid under there looked clear, I'd get imaging first yeah. and I'd start with a CT. Yeah, so obviously it's a case that you want to be thinking about that and you don't want to go straight to putting a tube in potentially. And in terms of, uh, so say your CT scan is okay, doesn't show any obvious skull base dehiscence. Um, would that change what you're doing in terms of managing things? You know, again, I, th I think if the CT was normal, no tegmin dehiscences, then yeah, certainly a myringotomy and tube would be reasonable. You certainly could also discuss uh, eustachian tube dilation on her. I, I would probably want to evaluate her for you know allergies. We can we can, can go through life and not have any problems with seasonal allergies, and then you know develop later in life or even in middle age or any time. And so I think it'd be important to evaluate for that. Query about smoking history or those types of exposures um, and those things prior to considering you know, surgical intervention other than tubes. So Gali, what do you think about, looks like she has some atelectasis, probably some serous otitis there. We may or may not be able to get her to auto-insufflate her ears. Um, is think, would you consider dilating? Would you consider ear tubes, tympanoplasty? What, what would you kind of be thinking about in terms of managing her going forward? Yeah, I'd probably start with ear tubes and see what happens. Um, tympanoplasty, mm, you know, Maybe, I guess my concern is that you would probably retract around whatever you did, but I mean, it just seems like very severe bilateral retraction. So um, I guess I have a concern about that. I personally do not yet feel comfortable to have enough balloon dilations under my belt to start ballooning somebody like this. So she has, so you have this patients, and they, these are obviously not that uncommon, unfortunately. They have this sort of adhesive otitis media atelectasis, completely, you know, very retracted drum that's redundant. And you kind of like some of the images we saw before, you put, you know, you could put an ear tube in, but you know the drum's never gonna come back to normal. And they've kind of tried the various things medically to try to manage their eustachian tube function, still not really getting good eustachian tube function. So it's those people that you know, they you see them years later and they've had 30 sets of tubes. You know, so how do you manage that patient earlier to try to prevent that repetitive process? And we, I was talking about it with somebody the other day. Um, so, some things that sometimes help is is to do a, is to stabilize an ear tube in some way so it's not doesn't need to be replaced all the time. Did anybody, I think I was discussing with somebody about subannular tubes versus cartilage shielded tubes. Any thoughts on that for managing this type of a patient? I, I don't do subannular. I, I mean, I don't. I've seen them before. They tend to get a lot. At least a few I've seen. They tend to get crusting. They do tend to. They can last a while. But I've also seen them plug up too, and then get a little kind of secondary acquired cholesteatoma around them occasionally. But I routinely do. Uh, you know, if I'm doing a tympanoplasty, put the tube through the cartilage graft, and you do that before you put the graft in. Yeah. Um, if you if you try to do it afterwards, it's a flog, and you're probably going to hit. You know, uh, mo kind of uh, 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 potentially injure your ossicles doing it. So. Any other thoughts, Brian? What do you? How do you? How do you manage these people? I mean, they're they're tough, right? Because otherwise, they just keep coming back. Every time you see them, the eardrum looks worse. And you put another tube in, they feel great for a couple months, six months, a year, and then the tube comes out, fluid comes back, you're back where you started again. You also hope they get a perforation at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I have patients who I place tubes every year or six months, and they didn't want to do anything else, so I just kept doing it. Um, and the, but yeah, I mean, I would definitely consider putting like a T tube that didn't work out for her. Then yeah, maybe consider cartilage cartilage tube, which I favor over the subannular tube as well. Yeah, I've done a few subannular tubes, none recently, and I had the same experience that. They can do really well. I have some that I did like 10 years ago. They still look great. Um, others tend to get keep accumulating debris for whatever reason, something related to the ear canal probably. So I, in the long term, I don't, I don't do those anymore. 
I think cartilage tympanoplasty with uh, basically a, a shield of cartilage with a hole, make a hole with a two millimeter biopsy punch, put a T-tube through it, just like he was showing in one of his videos there. Pretty straightforward, easy to do transcanal. It's a good procedure to, if you're doing just starting endoscopic ear surgery. It's a good one for that because you can put the tube posteriorly and good because you want to have good visualization. You don't want the tube going up against the ear canal. So take a very thin sliver, two millimeter biopsy punch, slide it through, just snip a little hole in the drum and to support the cartilage from underneath. And then obviously those will sometimes, the drum will kind of come back to normal position. They heal really well. Yep, Doug? So, you know, I've actually started doing these, putting those cartilage bedded T-tubes through a myringotomy. And you can actually take a little tracheal cartilage even in the clinic, put a T-tube through it. And, it. and the key is to make a big enough diameter hole so that the tube isn't pinched in the cartilage. But you can just slip it right through yeah, like you would do a tube. And they, they, I've had some of those in for like six, seven to ten years. So, um, so if you don't, for whatever reason, have a two millimeter punch, you can use like a five suction and puncture, put a few holes right on top of each other, essentially, and then you use a sharp knife to cut a hole in the perichondrin through the cartilage graft, and then you can put the T-tube in. One other thing with the T-tube is, I have no idea why the hell they make them so long. So I, I'll cut the flanges a little bit so it's not hitting the ossicular chain or, or hitting, you know, attaching to something else, and then I'll, I'll trim the length of the tube. The longer it is, the more likely it is to occlude with stuff. And and so if you make it a little shorter, um, it makes it easier to maintain and suction out if they have debris in it or things like that. The other thing, Brandon, when I cut the barrel, I cut the barrel to four millimeters and I cut it at an angle because uh, it increases the surface area so it clogs less. Uh, and the flanges I cut to two millimeters as well because I've actually had flange sitting on an ossicular chain. I don't know why, but the IS joint eroded over time. And I'm not sure if it was from the tube or not, but I felt pretty bad. Any other thoughts on management of that last case, sort of the long-term atelectasis collapsed ear? Tough, tough patient sometimes. Um, this is another, uh, so this is sort of a barotrauma situation. So um, obviously an individual with high performance requirements related to his ears, pressure equalization, and um, basically that one of the limitations to performing their profession is inability to equalize their ears. Um, so what are sort of the, the options for that? What, what, would you consider balloon dilation in this patient, Chad? Yes, I would. Um, with these patients, you have to be careful because they have to report anything they take to the FAA and it uh, can derail their career. So uh, um, for them, I would probably go straight to balloon dilation. For right. me, um, I would consider balloon dilation as well, although if he's having trouble and he had to change altitude rapidly, it may still be difficult for him. Um, if he's allowed to get tubes, I'd consider putting him in. Um, but it's possible that he might not be allowed to. Uh. Yeah, so obviously in this case, I'm not sure what it is here, but we'll see. <laughs> I was gonna say what's gonna be critical is the ear exam. Because it obviously, if he actually already has some irreversible tympanic membrane changes or things related to um, more chronic effects of eustachian tube dysfunction, that's not going to be a good candidate for dilation potentially. But it looks good. So, um, any thoughts on his uh, exam here, Brandon? Is tuning forks uh, bone greater than air with that audiogram? I think it must be. Oh, it must be. Okay. I think that's, that's, yeah, that's a little strange, but I think that's probably a mistake. Okay. And his exam looks pretty normal. Those yeah. both. I mean, the the right TM is a little bit opaque, but it looks fine otherwise. And the audiogram, there's maybe a tiny bit of high frequency, very very mild high frequency loss in the right ear, but there's nothing that nothing that looks significant on the exam or the audio. So, Cliff, quick question: How old is the audiogram? Yeah. Aha! Therein lies the trap. So this is where I'd, I'd probably ask the, the, the you know, look at the audiogram. If his tuning forks are abnormal now and the audiogram is six months old, it may, not, it may not be normal now. And I, I would repeat it pretty quickly. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, so it could be that there was an effusion when he had the audio, or did not have an effusion when the tuning fork tests were, had an effusion when the tuning fork was, was done. Um, we talked about a little bit at the beginning, always be thinking about the bone curves wouldn't necessarily apply in this patient, but just be thinking about canal dehiscence and kind of the masquerader of fullness in the ears um, might relate to pressure changes too, so people can be sensitive to pressure changes with that, so. Um, 
So we kind of talked about this. Um, I think Chad also mentioned you have to be thinking about what the person's profession is too and how what intervention you do might affect how they can do other things. So whether it's medications or having an ear tube. And again, just like it might be different if they were having a different profession where they had to dive, obviously you may not want to do ear tubes in that case. Um, so always be thinking about kind of the, the bigger picture of the individual. And what's highlighted here? Barrow challenge. Oh, barrow challenge. So might be reasonable. So guidelines say might be reasonable. So kind of fits with what we um, discussed there. So and then a, a final one here. 48-year-old uh, woman with oral fullness. She had a gastric bypass surgery. Big drop in BMI from 42 to 28. She's hearing this periodic swishing sound. Seems to get better when she lays down, goes to bed during the day. Her ears feel like they're still kind of full of fluid. Um, otherwise relatively healthy. She did have tubes as a kid. And uh, her bypass was uh, almost two years ago, and um, irregular periods. She's 48. So what are we sort of thinking in this person? Patchless. So we take a look here. Um, your exam looks very similar to the last patient. <laughs> <laughs> and on endoscopy, what would you say about the torus there? Yeah, it looks like she's got um, pretty open eustachian cartilaginous tube there. There's, she probably lost that fat pad there because she lost so much weight. Probably brought on her symptoms. And commonly, obviously, these patients have sort of an autophony, that sort of feeling that they're hearing themselves breathing or their jaws making sounds. Back to our differential again. Um, Anybody use estrogen for patchy cessation tuber? How do you how do you how do you all manage this problem? When you know it's you know for sure this is like patchless cessation tube, what do you do with them? I have a partner who's awesome, but again, she's going on maternity <laughs> leave. Uh, I, I've I've sometimes referred them to that patchland formula and had them try that. Um, I, I, they often don't come back, and I don't know whether that's working or they just didn't like my suggestion. Um, but my one of my colleagues who does who manages these patients, she does the you know angiocath with the serum in it or with the with the bone wax in it and puts it through the nasopharynx, and she's done some of those in clinic. She's also done those you know grafts where you make a little incision in the torus and push grafts up in there to try to make the lumen a little bit more narrow, and had some success with that. So I'm happy she's there, and hopefully she'll be back from maternity to leave soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm still a little bit afraid to do anything to treat patchless eustachian tube surgically. I remember as a resident, I had a couple patients at the VA who had had some Gore-Tex or something injected. And uh, they ended up with, you know, obviously massive eustachian tube dysfunction with obstruction and ended up with canal wall down cavities. So I always, when I'm telling these patients patchless eustachian tube, I said, this is awesome. You have the best result here is that your eustachian tube works great and you can equalize <laughs> pressure. It's no problem at all. We could treat this, we could give you a real problem, which is, you know, chronic middle ear disease, recurrent effusions, infections, and sometimes that works, but sometimes they're obviously they're still really annoyed, so um, it could be obviously very frustrating. Um, does so, anybody else use estrogen or any thoughts on that for, for this? Yeah, I, I use uh, estrogen drops in the nose. Seems like it does work for some patients. Okay, I, I actually haven't tried it, so I don't, I don't, so Cliff, don't the, know the data. The problem is you have to get those at a compounding pharmacy. And ah, okay. the, the pharmacy that's here actually makes them for us, and I don't even know what strength it is, but they have to use them usually for about three to six weeks to see if they're going to work. What, is that, what does that do to the mucosa? Or the it just creates edema. And so it's actually, uh, Mike Glasscock used to do that. That's how I learned it. And some of the folks that are doing the repairs, you know, sticking, you know, making decisions and sticking stents and things are using it as a trial before they do that to see if it'll actually improve the symptoms. And there's no side effects in the, in the nasal part of the exposure to the estrogen? No. Not that I've seen. Okay. All right. Question? I was going to add, I wanted to, what you're referring to Here we go. Back to listing. One of the people we refer to often for patchless, he does saline injections as kind of a first step hmm. to see if that helps. Um, pretty low risk, and then if they benefit from that, he'll try you know short-acting fillers, and then move on to more longer-lasting fillers to see if that works. Yeah. felt like the tubes improved the autophagy. Um, 
and I and I offer it to patients who who I who identify as. I do a trial and error guide also. Chat. Um. I think the placebo effect is strong in this group. Uh, I usually start with, um, I put a little uh, piece of acetrace in a cigarette paper on the eardrum. Uh, I've actually had patients come back and say they like that, they were fine uh, from that point. I offer them tubes. Uh, for patients who uh, want a procedure, uh, then I would probably inject saline around their eustachian tube orifice, and then if they like that, uh, um, you can consider input, uh, putting in uh, hydroxyapatite into it, so. Just a quick question on testing. I, I, I always am a little bit nervous because, you know, if you balloon a patchless eustachian two person, you're really, really hating, hating your life. Um, what do you guys do for testing to be, I mean, clearly use your history and all that sort of thing, but is there anything that you guys use that you say, this is my gold standard. If you fail this, you do not have patchless, you have eustachian, you know, the what do you guys use that way? I think actually when, when their story is fairly convincing for patulus, um, I think actually looking really carefully with respiration with the microscope can be really helpful or with an endoscope. And often for these folks, I think you can, you can watch them. You have them sniff, you have them breathe. You can see the eardrum moving. It's pretty dramatic that you would not normally see. So um, obviously you could do it more sophisticated ways with... Um, Temponometry and so forth, but I think respiratory variation of and looking at uh, basically the tone decay kind of model for tympanogram and looking at respiratory variation, but even just looking with a microscope, I think is helpful sometimes. You know, if anybody's interested, uh, Dennis Poe actually did a lecture for the Northwest Academy of Otolaryngology about four months ago, and I can forward you the email with the Northwest Academy website on it. You can click it; it's ninety minutes and. He talks a lot in that about avoiding the trap of balloon dilating a patchulant eustachian tube. And the other thing he brought out that was really interesting, a lot of people have ear fullness and pressure symptoms. And if you put your finger uh, into the, to the mandible up against the ramus and push on the, on the masseter muscle, uh, they'll come out of their chair. And he, and he says, you get their jaw treated and their ear pressure goes away. So he said he said people referred to him who've been balloon dilated for masseter spasm, uh, which is also probably not a good thing to do. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question from a practical standpoint. Operatively, any suggestions or techniques people have tried and used successfully for avoiding bad anatomy? So try to avoid doing a septoplasty with either smaller scopes or angled scopes from a different side. Any, any suggestions for just bad septal deviation that could be prohibitive? I mean, one thing that could be sort of helpful, it's a pretty obvious thing, but you can use the balloon, but the balloon itself to try to um, lateralize the inferior turbinate. So that's one thing you can try if you haven't tried that, but to avoid doing a septoplasty to get the balloon back there. Is that what you mean? Yeah. That would be a great question, by the way, to bring out to the sinus people. And Dr. Sanjay Parikh is in the back row, and he can probably help answer that. I have a question, actually. <laughs> uh, far away. Um, it was about to, you know, she's right in front of you know. I, I, I have several that I, I have several patients with that are adolescent that have um, four or five sets of ear tubes. Oh, hang on, really. Thank you. I have four, five. I have several patients that have had another fifth set of tubes. They're 16 years old, 15 years old. They have atelectatic eardrums. Every time the tube falls out, the effusion comes back. Do we have technology ready for that age group for eustachian dilation? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think this is evolving, uh, and uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, Has anyone done anyone less than 18? How how young do the indications go? So you, anytime, you, if you do it under 18, it's off-label. So I have discussions with the family about that, and then there's issues with insurance coverage. Never, I've never, I, if someone, anybody has any craniofacial or syndromes, I definitely would not recommend it in that. Um, I think the youngest I've done was 10, maybe. Um, and again, the, the typical cases I've been using it on are like the recurrent retractions or recurrent cholesteatoma, and that's a different patient than the, the type C and middle ear effusion patients, so not really sure if it's going to help, but it was kind of like a something we could try instead of the 
repeat cycle of tubes. And anecdotally, do you think it, it helps? Like it helps adults or tough to say? Yeah, tough to say. Thank you. For your stage tube dilation or in children? No, no, not in my practice. I mean, well, not that I've caused. I've seen patients who've been dilated elsewhere that had patchless, and it wasn't really a necessarily a nightmare, but the patient was kind of frustrated about the situation. So I've not seen any like carotid injuries or anything like that. Yeah. And I think there's a difference between a disaster complication and a really ticked off patient. Yeah. They get really ticked off yeah. if someone says, oh, they dilated you for a dilation problem. Uh, I've seen that periodically. And some of these people are pretty focused on their disease. So one of the things I'd like to do, and I want to get to this before we break for lunch, that just uh, uh, one slide and then one, one quick case about something that's becoming far too complicated. But I love to pull slides out that we used years ago and talk about them again. So this was put up on a panel as a proposed uh, uh, tiered management for Meniere's syndrome or Meniere's disease. And this is when you know there was some of the various devices that were available. With the panel, just real quickly, if you look at this, is there is this the way, is this the order that you would consider managing uh, Meniere syndrome? Uh, well, some of these things would probably, in my practice, have fallen off. I haven't done a nerve section in like 10 years. Um, I occasionally do a labyrinthectomy a couple of times a year. I've tried to push doing an, impl if I can, and they're not Medicare, I, you can sometimes do a concurrent cochlear implant. Um, uh, I rarely do endolymphatic sac surgery, maybe a couple of times a year, if that. Uh, do a lot more steroid injections, a lot more hand holding, you know, a lot of placebo beta histine, you know, um, anything to kind of just keep them from the operating room. Because again, I think this is a medical disease, and I don't, I don't. I, other than like, if someone has really refractory vertigo, a labyrinthectomy is a very effective operation. But if they have poor hearing. Um, and again, again, most patients I try to talk off the cliff and manage them medically, aggress aggressively medically. You want to just pass it? We'll just pass it right around. Go down. Um, I treat it kind of like a migraine in addition to this right here. So salt-reduced diet, have patients identify triggers for um, their attacks. If that doesn't work, then I move up to uh, uh, beta histine. Uh, which I find very effective. Um, then uh, diuretics, uh, if that doesn't work, and then try to come down off of that because most patients don't really like it. Um, the one, <clears throat> I've had patients respond, uh, I usually only do uh, steroids if uh, patients are having really rapidly fluctuating hearing, hearing in a short period of time, like daily, um, and uh, the other thing, when they get drop attacks, I'm very, very uh, aggressive about steroids in uh, this group of patients because you don't want them to fall and break, break your hip. Good. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add. I, I would agree with what Chad was saying is that I think if this was 10 years old, we didn't appreciate as much the overlap with migraine and sort of the intensity of which I pursue the, the, in the conservative group here with um, dietary management, trigger management, and so forth, I think is important. And part of that's just helping the patient understand the fluctuation of the disease. So I'm not sure that I'm affecting it as much as I would like to, but I think helping them understand the components that uh, contribute to it in them. Um, and I agree, bursts of oral steroids can sometimes be helpful. Um, in terms of nerve sections and labyrinthectomies, again, those are, I would agree, that's relatively rare. And I rarely do um, sac surgery. Right. Um. Yeah, I agree. Um, my, I, I, I believe I, uh, my a migraine is a huge factor for these patients. So I, instead of doing a salt restricted diet, I have them kind of do like a migraine diet and the magnesium B2 supplements, and that can help. Um, diuretic usually, um, if they have vertigo, um, beta histine. I've been starting to do a little more steroid injections a lot, um, oral steroids sometimes. Chetamycin I do occasionally if it's pretty bad. Their hearing is not, not the best. I like that better than labyrinthectomy, like surgical labyrinthectomy. Um, and I'm a believer in endolymphatic sac surgery. I don't do a ton of them, but I think, uh, you know, knock on wood, every single one I've done has been helpful. You know, not completely um, getting rid of the disease, but I think it's been helpful. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that was said. I, I just. I have such a concern for um, bilateral hypofunction if it becomes bilateral Meniere's. 
that I am not interested in doing anything that is destructive uh, and will and really have done. So I would basically put endothelial sac surgery before gentamicin and then move those three destructive gentamicin neurosection and, uh, and labyrinthectomy sort of very far away. Yeah, and I think the purpose of some of the slide is uh, things do change over time. And uh, this was a, when Medtronic had bought that, whatever that machine was that put a bunch of pressure uh, things through a tube into your ear, which... Uh, Mignette. The Mignette device, which actually Medtronic ended up buying all those back off, uh, off Craigslist and uh, they no longer exist. But I agree with Gabi, when this came out, uh, I, I challenged it because genomycin is actually a destructive procedure. That's just like doing a labyrinthectomy on people. Uh, so I put in lymphatic sac surgery ahead of it. Also on here, you don't see the use of steroids. And oftentimes people will do an intrapanic steroid injection and it breaks the cycle of attacks for people. Uh, so does anybody do like, will you do like three steroid injections or how many injections will you do before you abandon that or you just do one and see if they get better? I usually try raw steroids before going to uh, uh, intratympanic um, injections. And, but, I do, but I do like uh, usually four. If four. the patient says I feel better, I would stop. But. Yeah, so it's really interesting is which steroid do you use? If you use prednisone, uh, most prednisone uh, formulations are stabilized with sodium. So if they're salt sensitive, you have to be careful about that. And a lot of people aren't salt sensitive, probably 15% of people aren't. So that's not a big deal. Uh, the migraine issue is a big one. What we've actually inserted in there is salt restriction diet slash physical therapy consultation. And what we do is we're finding that the physical therapists actually spend a fair amount of time with these people, which we can't spend. But the people are so tensed up in their neck that when they get their necks loosened up, their symptoms drop out. And it is just, I don't know about you all, but this whole presumed diagnosis of Meniere's has skyrocketed since COVID. So you take society, crank up their stress level, and everybody's dizzy, it seems like. So anyway, uh, it's just fun to kind of go back and revisit years later what we were talking about. Yeah. Bring up beta histine. What dose? Oh, you can get it. They, they'll compound it. You got to compound it. Cascade can do it for you. But what's your dose of beta histine? I have to keep it written down, but I think it's eight milligrams uh, and increase three to eight milligrams three times a day. Increase it to twenty-four over three weeks, uh, and let the patient kind of titrate it to their symptoms. Who else uses it? Cliff, do you use it? You have to get that in a compounding pharmacy, though, at least in this area. It's really, it is ubiquitous in Canada. Uh, every major medical center uses it. And if nothing else, it really makes them all red, and they forget they're dizzy for a minute or two. All right, so I'd just like to say we've really worked the panel very hard today, so thank you very much. And uh, this is the end of the best part of the course. So I know you guys are stuck for another day and a half learning about you know endoscopes and noses and things like that. So we'd like to conclude it by, Linda thinks she's actually coming up here to tell you about CME, but I would just like everyone to give Linda a hand. She has pulled off an amazing year.